Good afternoon. My name is Ed Howard. I'm with the Alliance for Health Reform. And on behalf of Senator Rockefeller, Senator Blunt, our board of directors, I want to welcome you to today's program on how well prepared federally qualified health centers, FQHCs, are for major health system changes that are afoot. And by the way, FQHC is one of those essential, it's not an acronym actually, it's a collection of, of uh, letters, but whatever it is, you gotta know what it means to be able to negotiate the next hour and 45 minutes. Uh, now, I am informed reliably that there are some differences between Democrats and Republicans on health policy issues. <laughs> Melinda told me this. Uh, but uh, there's a rare area of agreement that FQHCs serve a vital purpose in getting access to primary care and more to 20 million or so Americans every year. Uh, now, President George W. Bush uh, moved to double the number of centers during his tenure in office. Congress added funds for those centers in both the Affordable Care Act and the stimulus package. Uh, in addition to the regular appropriations under the, the uh, statutes governing the centers. And now we have the coverage expansion underway that's bringing in new customers, new challenges uh, to these federally qualified centers. They face fiscal and physical uncertainties, and the health of some of the most vulnerable people in the country depend on how those uncertainties are resolved. Now today we're gonna to take a close look at the experiences of two exemplary FQHCs and take a broader look at the issues facing all of them. Uh, now you can infer, I think correctly from their title, that federal health policy decisions will have substantial impact in how well these challenges get met. And we're very pleased to have as our partner today the uh, Commonwealth Fund, uh, nearly a century old philanthropy established uh, uh, originally in New York and now a strong Washington presence to promote the common wheel, the common good. Uh, and we're doubly pleased to have as co-moderator from the fund, Melinda Abrams, who is the vice president in charge of their program on healthcare delivery system reform. Uh, she's also uh, coincidentally and fortunately a nationally known expert in this field and, uh, by the way, a leader in putting together the new survey by the fund of FQHCs that's being released today. And you have uh, material about that. And I uh, welcome Melinda back to the, to the chair here. And we're looking forward to helping, having you help to frame the issues for us today and tell us a bit about the results of the new survey. Melinda? Great, thank you very much, Ed, and thanks to the Alliance and uh, all of you for being here today. So as um, Ed mentioned, just by kind of quick background, and there are other people on this panel who, are mu who could also provide this breadth of perspective, but just wanted to kind of remind everyone that the uh, nation's community health centers play a critical role in our primary care safety net as our primary care safety net in the United States. And as of 2012, there were about 1,200 federally qualified health centers serving more than 21 million patients through 8,500 sites. And the, um, so majority of their patients are uninsured or publicly insured. And when you look at them, more than 84% of their patients um, earn under 200% of poverty. So again, really treating kind of our low-income and middle-income patient population. The Affordable Care Act, as Ed mentioned, has the potential to increase demand for our nation's FQHCs because these coverage, because of the major coverage provisions target low and middle-income Americans. So the Commonwealth Fund conducted a survey in the summer and fall of 2013, and it is a survey of FQHC leaders, primarily completed by either executive directors or chief medical officers, and it asked them about kind of their views, and their views on, you know, kind of what they perceive to be some of the challenges in 2014 with uh, 
you know, the new coverage, uh, the new coverage provisions taking effect. It did also ask them to report on kind of current shortages. It also asked them about other, a number of other questions about their current capacity. So what we are releasing today is two briefs from this national survey. We had about a 60% response rate. And we surveyed the, we asked the universe and we got 60% uh, response back um, to report on, again, their capacity, both in terms of kind of their technology, but also in terms of the personnel. So just by way, quickly, just saying that when we asked these health center leaders um, about what they perceived to be some of the challenges in 2014, a number of them are concerned about physician shortages, uh, an overwhelming majority, as you can see. Um, but it's not just on the physician side, it's also with nurse practitioners and physician assistants. And again, just to be clear, this is their perceived concerns. This was you know, last summer. So it's not saying that as of right now that these are shortages. These are what they're, this is kind of what keeps them up at night. I think that's the way to think about it. But when we did ask them, well, tell us about kind of budgeted positions that for whom, where there are vacancies. So positions that you have budgets for that you're, you know, you're trying to fill. A majority of them do report that there, is, there are shortages of primary care physicians and, and nurse practitioners and physician assistants. So there are, you know, there, they are reporting current shortages. A couple of things about that. They also report shortages of uh, mental health providers um, as well as bilingual personnel. But when we compared, so the Commonwealth Fund did this survey in 2013, but we also did a survey, very similar survey, national survey in 2009. And as many of you may know, if you follow the health center issues, that um, you know, clinician shortages is a long-standing concern. Um, this is not a new problem. And when we compared it to 2009, it's relatively consistent. So that's just something to note. So yes, there are shortages, but it's not necessarily worse. So take that for whatever, for what it's worth. Um, in light of their, in light of, you know, in, um, the, in, you know, anticipated influx of new patients as a result of the Affordable Care Act, um, and in light of the concerns about personnel shortages, FQHCs are actively working on ways to prepare for new patients. And as you can see here, whether it's hiring and training staffs to apply for health insurance coverage, um, more than half of them are working on integrating behavioral health. Uh, many are also working more than a third or about a third are working on hiring new clinical staff. So yes, there are these concerns, but they are actively working on trying to address them. So as I said, in addition to kind of the personnel issues and, and we, capacity, we also asked um, these health center leaders to report on you know, their capacity in terms of information technology. Um, and what we found was that we saw more, in terms of the uh, adoption of electronic health records, we saw a huge increase, tremendous increase, more than double, where it was 40% of health centers reported that they had um, an EHR in place in 2009. It's up to 93% in 2013. And it's not just about having you know, the, the wires and, and the hardware in, in, their, in their sites, um, but actually about using them. And so we also asked about, a, about their functionality, everything from kind of tracking lab results, um, preventive care reminders, uh, you know, uh, alerts if there's a medication, um, gonna be a medication interaction, a number of things, whether or not you can sort patients by condition or medication and things like that. We have 13, um, and if you, and, and of the, the number of the percent of FQHCs that have advanced capacity, as you can see here is also an, inc an incredible increase from what we saw in 2009, from 30% to 85%. Now, that's not to say that this was easy. <laughs> as any of you know who look at um, information technology adoption, in healthcare, and you look at whether it's office-based practices or federally qualified health centers, but this was a survey of federally qualified health centers, a lot of them talked about you know, challenges, such as the training of the staff, 
lost productivity, the costs of maintaining them, you know, of maintaining the system, and, and the usefulness of some of these templates to manage the entire population, either they're not just the population of impaneled patients, but also kind of uh, across the community. So there's certainly challenges. What we don't have, um, which I just wanted to kind of give you a quick preview to, what we don't have in the briefs that are being released today, but future data that will come out from this survey, is that while we see that there is this perception and view and concern about their, um, their personnel capacity and ability to kind of retain their staff, when we also ask them about kind of ability to provide access same day or next day, we actually found that there was pretty good access um, when we, and this is again just reporting what you currently can offer your patients. So 62% of our health centers said that they can usually, um, the patients can receive telephone advice after hours. Over half can receive care, uh, can receive an appointment either same day or next day. Um, and 22% um, can easily obtain um, specialist procedures for their Medicaid patients. So there's definitely some work to do, C continues to be an ongoing issue around kind of access to specialty care. So what does all this mean and, and why, are we, why, why do we see this um, tremendous increase on, on the information technology and what, a, what does all of this portend in terms of the personnel issues that we found? So again, I want people to walk away with, you know, the a sense that health centers are a critical part of the safety net. We do expect them to see more patients and they will continue to need help to attract primary care providers and other clinical per personnel um, to those centers. And that it's maybe largely about kind of the personnel, but it's also maybe about new models of care that a lot of them are working on, such as expanding telehealth and telemonitoring um, as well, and, and so that's another way of expanding their capacity and working in teams, such as we find with patients in our medical homes or with health homes. Another piece, and, and Leighton Koo will get into this in a minute, is that the trust fund um, is set to, which is the Health Center Trust Fund is $11 billion in the Affordable Care Act to support FQHCs in anticipation of their increased demand, is set to expire in 2015. And we just need to ask ourselves <coughs> whether or not there is um, adequate support continued support for health centers and whether or not they have adequate stability to kind of continue to meet the needs of new patients and, ex and expanded patients because they will also continue to see the remaining uninsured. The integration with behavioral health is critical because such a large proportion of their patient population have uh, mental health and substance abuse issues and a lot of this is being addressed through the health home provision of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and maybe kind of considering and how what important how important that that provision is and that program is for the states that have um, taken that on. I think the other thing is no question the adoption of HID is quite impressive, um, and I think it shows that the value of kind of the targeted federal funding as well as the financial incentives that have been uh, focused on on community health centers have really made a difference. But there are still gaps. Um, these gaps are not. Uh, these gaps are not exclusive to health FQHCs, but the gaps really are about interoperability from within the center to those outside of the center, as well as also patient access, um, you know, patient portals, patient access to their records. So there's still more work to do. So that's just, these are just conclusions and implications from our survey, but our panel today is actually gonna be talking about a broader range of issues. I'm really excited to hear them. And these will be some of the questions um, for us, you know, to kind of, for them to consider for you and for them to answer in terms of, you know, projecting uh, what they see as some of the impact of projecting coverage expansions um, and how uh, the federal investments have affected their operations, challenges they see moving forward, and what can federal officials do to make it easier for them to fulfill their missions and successfully meet the needs of their patients. I did not do this alone, and I'd like to really recognize my colleagues at the Commonwealth Fund who help analyze and write these, um, these, these briefs, but also an external technical expert panel who provided invaluable guidance to the Commonwealth Fund as we develop the survey. So, Ed, I'll pass it back to you. Okay, thanks very much, Melinda. Um, 
just a little bit of housekeeping before we get to our speakers. There are, as there always are, uh, a treasure trove, I guess it is a treasure trove, of materials in your packets on this subject, including uh, a list of some things that aren't in your packets, but if you go online to allhealth.org, you can hit the link to get to each of those uh, that are on that list. There are uh, biographical sketches of each of our speakers uh, that'll provide you more background on uh, exactly who they are. There will be a video recording of this briefing uh, available on the Alliance website at allhealth.org <laughs> in a couple of days, and a couple of days after that, a transcript that uh, will allow you to peruse every word that you have heard. The kits also contain a card, a green card, that you can use to write a question on at the appropriate time, and there are microphones where you can go to uh, voice your question at the appropriate time, and a blue evaluation form that we, as always, would uh, be delighted if you would take the time to fill out so that we can improve these briefings and respond to the needs that you have uh, for briefings on topics and speakers that uh, will, will serve your purposes. Uh, if you are tweeting, and we would encourage you to tweet, the hashtag health centers will do it for you. And um, with that, I think we can get to the program. Uh, and we're going to start, if we can, with uh, Leighton Koo, <laughs> if I can find him on the panel. Uh, he's a professor at George Washington University. He directs the Center for Health Policy Research there. Uh, he's one of the country's leading experts in, among other things, uh, coverage for vulnerable populations and Medicaid and the healthcare safety net, all of which will serve him well in mastering and conveying to you uh, information on the topic at hand today. And today we've asked him to identify some of the major issues facing FQHCs in this time of rapid expansion of lower income Americans with coverage. Uh, and to also share with him, with you and, and us, uh, some of the insights from his examination of what's been happening in Massachusetts since, uh, you know, with health centers uh, since its expansion of coverage in 2006. Leighton, welcome back. Happy to have you with us. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the Alliance and the Commonwealth Fund for having me. Uh, I, I realize the title, Critical Issues Facing Communities, it sounds a little dire. Uh, it, it, occur, it occurs to me that my, my feeling has been about community health centers for a long time as sort of like uh, in the TV show MacGyver, or maybe 24 is the correct analog today. You know, you find yourself in a, in a, in a pit with alligators uh, and, you, and you think this is the end. Uh, and then somehow the, the hero pulls out a ballpoint pen and some bubble gum and maybe there's a friend who manages to, to, to figure out a way to escape and, and save the day. And, and in the end, I, I'm often impressed that community health centers are, are amazingly resourceful and ingenious and through good leadership uh, manage to make what seems like a dire situation into a, to a happy ending. And so certainly that's what I hope. But. Uh, let me start. What I'm going to talk about today is, is, is a few points mentioning that insurance expansions we know uh, are leading to an increase in the demand for primary care services at the release by the newly insured, and that health centers play a central role in filling that need, and at the same time, they continue to serve the uninsured. Uh, another thing that's important is that this is a good thing because health centers can help reduce medical expenditures. Uh, there are some areas where things are, are still a little unclear. So what are the relationships between health centers and the new health insurance exchanges is, is still a little murky. Uh, Medicaid expansions uh, help health centers and will help them expand uh, their capacity. But as Melinda mentioned just a moment ago, uh, there are some worries about a potential funding cliff after 2015. So the first part. So this is a slide that shows what happened in Massachusetts before and after uh, chapter 58, which was its big health uh, insurance reform. And of course, much of the federal reform sort of was designed to emulate what happened in Massachusetts. So what we see is after that time, Massachusetts uh, health centers have served another 200,000 people. So really sort of stepped up to, to, to take on capacity. In addition, during that time, 
the percentage of patients who were uninsured at health centers fell from around 36% to around 20%. Now, they're still serving a lot of uninsured patients. The uninsurance rate in Massachusetts is around 4%, so it's still serving a disproportionate share of the uninsured. But the fact that there was growth in Medicaid, that there was growth in that yellow patch, which is called Commonwealth Care, which is sort of the analog to the health insurance exchanges, really led to the ability for health, and health centers to expand capacity and to fill in the slack. So not only were they they're commonly called safety net providers, they were also a safety valve for the system. Now, one of the reasons that we think that this is a good thing is because health centers, to the extent that they are providing good quality primary care to people who otherwise would have difficulty getting that, the evidence suggests that they actually save money. So this was a study that we did that basically looked at what were the annual medical expenditures for people who went to community health centers versus those who did not. And what we found was that actually total medical expenditures, so this is hospital expenditures, ER expenditures, total ambulatory care expenditures, drug expenditures, were about one quarter less for people who went to health centers, suggesting that they can have a profound effect in helping to bend the cost curve down by providing better primary care to people who otherwise just wouldn't get it. So one of the new landmark parts of uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, are the creation of the health insurance exchanges, and as well as the Medicaid expansions. Health centers have been dealing with Medicaid for a long time. The health insurance exchanges, it's still sort of a new relationship. Under the Affordable Care Act, qualified health plans, so those the insurance plans that operate under the exchanges, must contract with some quote unquote essential community providers. And CHCs are some of those essential community providers. Uh, it doesn't say how many uh, exactly, and in addition, there's some flexibility in negotiating uh, what the payment rates are for the community health centers. It's still not completely clear how many health centers have obtained contracts with qualified health plans uh, that would therefore let them serve the patients uh, of those uh, of the health centers. And in addition to that, at least the anecdotal information suggests that the payment rates are often low and well below the rates that they expected to get, which are equivalent to the sorts of payment rates in Medicaid, which are actually pretty good for health centers. Uh, one of the things that this leaves is an additional problem that uh, in many cases, many of the new insurance plans that patients have have relatively high deductibles. So health centers uh, still will subsidize care and offer a sliding fee scale for people. What this means is that essentially speaking, they may have a, a privately insured patient but they still have to underwrite the care, and effectively, from the perspective of the health center, it's like this person is an uncompensated care patient. So they're still bearing uncompensated care cost, uh, regardless of the fact that now they, they have a patient who's insured. So to talk a little about health center financing, and, and of course, on one hand, this may put some people to sleep. On the other hand, money's always a popular topic in Washington. I know that. So, Health centers are funded by what's called Section 330 of the Public Health Service Act, and they're the core funding for health center funding. However, health centers get funding from a variety of sources, of which Medicaid is the largest source. Uh, the two working, work together and actually act synergistically to improve the capacity of health centers, to improve their capacity to serve uninsured and low-income patients. The Section 330 funds, the core grant funds, fund infrastructure, they help directly support care for the uninsured, but they also help fill in gaps that are left by insurance payments that are not adequate. And so most insurance payments at health centers are less than the actual cost of providing care, partly because health centers provide a, a, a relatively rich set of packages, including uh, social services, enhanced services, to help their needy patients. So the grants end up supporting both the insured and the uninsured patients. Now, what's happened in the Affordable Care Act is it was anticipated that there would be a need to build up the infrastructure of community health centers to serve uh, patients uh, who were low-income patients and, and areas that were underserved across the country. So it built in mandatory funds under a trust fund to supplement the regular appropriations. However, those trust funds expire at the end of 2015. What this means is that there's a funding cliff that will begin in 2016 and if the Section 330 appropriations aren't increased to compensate for the loss of the mandatory funds, there could be some serious issues, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then I know Michelle Prozer will also talk a little about this. So Medicaid expansions play a big role here. Medicaid expansions will add revenue 
And by doing this, help the health centers not only serve more Medicaid patients, but also more uninsured patients, more Medicare patients, more exchange patients. Uh, so one of the net effects is that in addition to this, this is where things work together. Uh, about half the states are expanding Medicaid, about half the states are not. If more states expanded Medicaid, uh, health centers would be able to serve more patients, particularly in the, the patients in the, in the states that are currently not expanding them. So this is from a, some analyses that some colleagues of mine did just recently that looked at the 2012 caseloads uh, in Medicaid and found that of people who are currently being served as uninsured patients in Medicaid, uh, about 2.3 million of them appeared to be eligible in the opt-out states, that is the states that aren't expanding Medicaid, about 2.9 million uh, are eligible for either Medicaid or the health insurance exchanges in the states that are expanding Medicaid. The thing that's really important is to know is that black section. So there are 1.1 million people who would be eligible if the state had expanded Medicaid to the 133% of poverty level. If the state does not expand Medicaid, these 1.1 million people will remain uninsured. They will remain, therefore, uncompensated care patients uh, for, for the health centers. And in addition, they're going to have the problems of getting specialty care that Melinda was just talking about uh, in her prior presentation. The others uh, will be eligible for either the, the premium subsidies under the Affordable Care Act for the exchanges. Uh, many of them will get health insurance coverage. They're not all going to get covered. And on the expansion states, again, all those 2.9 million uh, will be eligible for either the health insurance exchange subsidies or Medicaid. Once again, maybe not all of them will get coverage, but at least there's the potential for them to getting into coverage. So where I want to wrap up is talking about what we think this has in terms of implications for our ability to serve people. As Melinda mentioned, in the last official data that we have available, there were about 21 million patients being served at health centers in 2012. So what this graph shows is a comparison. So the reason there are the stack bars is the blue bars are the states that we think are expanding Medicaid. The yellow are the green bars are the states, the patients in the states that we don't think are expanding Medicaid. Our current projection is that based on funding for 2014, the number of patients who can be served is, is more like over 25 million. So in fact, we will be able to pick up around 4 million additional patients in health centers. So that'll really go a long way in serving the primary care needs of newly insured people. And again, help out, there are lots of people who are already insured that have problems getting access simply because they live in remote or underserved areas. If the grant funding level is low, that is if the Appropriations do not compensate for the loss uh, of, the, of the mandatory funds under the ACA. These caseloads could plummet. So the third bar says that in 2020, we would expect around 20 million patients could be served. That is, we'd lose about more than 5 million patients. Getting close to 6 million patients who were served this year would not have service, would not be able to get care in 2020. Actually, it occurs before that. We just drew our projections out to 2020. Uh, because of the low grant levels. If, on the other hand, grant funding continues to grow, not necessarily as rapidly as it has just recently, but still maintaining a modest growth rate after 2015, uh, we could actually get to the point where uh, health centers would be serving about 35 million patients. So it could really make a big dent in meeting the primary care needs of patients all across the country. The last two bars show what happens if the states that are not expanding Medicaid expand Medicaid instead. So we find that that increases furthermore the capacity in those states that if potential with the combined with the high grants, actually they could reach 36 million more patients, 36 million patients. So this would make a big difference, particularly in those states that are not expanding patients to help meet the needs of Medicaid patients and the uninsured patients. So health centers can go a long way to meeting the primary care needs of vulnerable low income patients on the other hand, that is very much at risk if the mandatory funds are not replaced in some manner, shape, or form uh, in 2016. Thanks. Thank you, Leighton. Um, and before we hear from our next speaker, I neglected to mention that the briefing is being carried live on C-SPAN 3, so you can both tell your colleagues about it by email so that they can tune in, if you would. And I would remind anyone who is watching on C-SPAN 3 that they can follow along, including with the speaker's slides, uh, by looking at them on 
uh, allhealth.org's web website uh, so that you can get a better sense of what's, what's uh, uh, being presented right here. Now, uh, we're going to turn to a couple of folks who have an intense familiarity with the challenges and the chances to help that FQHCs present uh, because they run them. And first, we're going to hear from Vernita Todd, who's the CEO at the Heart City Health Center in Elkhart, Indiana. Uh, she knows her way around the world of nonprofit organizations generally as well. She's a longtime consultant to nonprofits in a range of management issues. And she faces uh, many challenges at Heart City, including integrating the full range of services to a diverse and growing population and managing those new technology uh, uh, services that Melinda was talking about that are needed to operate effectively and deliver quality care. And we're delighted that you could join us today, Vernita. Well, thank you, Ed, and Alliance and Commonwealth for having me here, for you, for giving up your Friday afternoon. I guess if Leighton said that he's going to compare us to 24, I'm Jackie Bauer. Uh, we, can get, <laughs> we can get you access to health care, but if you're in a pit of alligators, you might be on your own. So just uh, keep that in mind. We're not all things to all people. So I'm here today to share with you a little bit about comprehensive um, overview of community health centers, and they gave me 600 seconds. So I'm going to do a little bit of a synopsis of the slides that you saw. Certainly, there will be time for questions afterwards. Um, but hopefully, there will be enough substance in the slides so that when you go home and you're making those or giving input to those all-important funding and policy decisions, you'll have something to look back on as we talk about today. So um, the presentation, again, will get started. They asked to share a little bit about Heart City Health Center. We are in Elkhart, Indiana, a population of about 51,000. Our health center sees a little more than 10,000 people a year, which uh, is not very much when you're considering my colleague Brooks down the road, but represents 20% of our city's population. So we are a safety net provider serving a large group of folks within the Elkhart community. Um, and we have the requisite medical, dental, behavioral health, and an on-site pharmacy, which is a great benefit for our patients. We are more than excited to announce that we're opening a second clinic on June 3rd that we um, were able to do, thanks in part, by a grant during the uh, Affordable Care Act, a new access point. So 3,500 additional Elkhart residents will have access to a medical home coming June 3rd. I would note to you that since that press release went out to our community, we receive 15 to 20 calls a day from people who are trying to get access and who need care. Um, and this is before we ask the hospitals to open the gate. So we know that once they're referring folks, that that 3,500 number will fill up pretty quickly. Uh, <clears throat> slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. Slide indicates that 47% of low-income families do not have access to a primary care provider, uh, and that low income is uh, $44,000 for a family of four um, or less. A little bit about our patient population. I think it mirrors many of the slides that Melinda showed earlier. We do have a very large Medicaid population. Um, over half of our patients we serve are on Medicaid. 77% fall at or below 100% of poverty. Um, and we serve a very diverse patient population. Elkhart, Indiana is one of the um, more diverse communities when it comes to Hispanic and Latino families, largely due to the RV industry and the, and the opportunity for work in that area. Elkhart got the dubious distinction in 2009 of having the highest unemployment rate in the country prompting a, a visit from the president at the time. I'm happy to say we have bounced back, but recovery looks different, jobs look different, most are part-time. Um, many are victim to automation, um, and, and so it doesn't look exactly like it did before, and we're still having people have difficulties. The thing I would point out to you is 44% of our patients are kids under the age of 12. So while the need for access still exists for adults, what we're finding is uh, we have a large patient population of children because there are very few Medicaid providers in our community. This slide needs to be updated. I am so proud to announce that yesterday, Indiana Governor Mike Pence 
Pence announced the expansion or a des desire to expand access to low-income families. Notice I didn't say he expanded Medicaid. Um, he'd probably be very happy with me for that. But he did expand access to low-income families using what we have now, the Healthy Indiana Plan. They're actually calling it um, HIP 2.0. So while there are some financial obligations for the folks that are involved and not making it a free access to care like Medicaid is, we believe it's a great, or I believe, after um, a quick review of something that was released yesterday, that it is a good compromise between fiscal responsibility and access to care for the families that are the most vulnerable. Uh, the plan calls for, if you're doing a basic plan, no actual monthly premium but you have a copay on every service, or the more robust plan, which includes a monthly premium based on family size and income at a max level of $25 a month. Um, so we'll be interested to see how Indiana responds during the public comment period and hopefully be ready to um, provide care for those families starting J January of 2015. What we know is that that increased access is going to, or the need and demand, is going to play some capacity um, challenges. I just mentioned we're the only safety net provider. Many don't take Medicaid. Uh, the compensation rate is comparable with HIP, so we could face that same issue with Medicaid. So the heart of my presentation is a little bit about HIT and primary care in the patient-centered medical home. And what this slide shows you is the increased need for the primary care provider kind of to be the keeper of knowledge and data, as well as the person that helps the patient navigate through what can sometimes be a complex um, healthcare system. If you live in it, you understand it. If you just need to access it because you're sick, it can get be a tough thing to understand. So while we're here, um, it, we implemented an electronic medical record to allow us to do this, to be able to not only guide the patients to the referrals that they needed, but to be able to bring together and reconcile the information so that somebody had a big picture of what was going on in that patient's life. I would say our use of technology, uh, we were one of the health centers in 2009 who had just started the EHR or electronic health record implementation. We went from uh, a practice management system in 2009 and in 2011 went live with the electronic medical record. What we learned quickly is it's not a panacea. It is not that GE commercial where all the specialists are in the audience and they're screaming them out, this is what happened. Um, when I say it's not a panacea, it's a great system. It does help you. But with the lack of other providers having electronic medical records technology, it's a little antisocial. So we have information, but the information is not coming back to us. Um, the other thing that I would tell any of my colleagues and all of you who are impacting policy is that buying the system is just the first of 100 costs. Uh, getting the hardware and the software is important, getting it maintained uh, and providing support because let's face it, if you, if on a paper record system, circle, 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 go on, circle, 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 go on. On an EMR, if your computer goes down, it's a very different world. And yes, you may be able to go back to that circling an encounter on a paper, but then someone is responsible for going and putting all that information back into the electronic medical record so that we're still keeping that information. Um, I would also say that not many providers in our community have adopted yet. Our local hospital has, and we're very fortunate to have built an interface with them, uh, but there are three hospitals that patients utilize in our community. Oh, let me just say on this last slide, meaningful use of the uh, EHR does not equate to better outcomes alone. This is a shared responsibility. We can certainly become more efficient and effective and have better information, but it is a partnership with the patient to equate to better outcomes, not simply an alert or the ability to function more effectively. I won't share much on this slide, but it talks about meaningful use, which is some of the financial incentives that are available to all health providers who adopt an electronic medical record. Um, 
And so there's more information on here. We are doing the Medicaid meaningful use, which is roughly 63.5 in incentives. What we found out, though, is, as Melinda uh, mentioned about the recruiting shortage, that we do bring on new providers whose providers, uh, former workplaces, have attested to some portion of meaningful use, so they um, don't come to us with the ability to generate the level of incentive for any new provider coming in. Just a little bit about the money, because I know everybody cares about that. We were able to... Um, get about a $55,000 grant from the federal government through HRSA for the implementation of a patient uh, portal, excuse me, a patient management or tracking software. But if you look at the yellow line, that's the amount that we've invested in EHR since we started in 2009, $861,000. Um, and so it's costly. We just need folks to know that going, going forward. A little bit, it's not as easy as Wi-Fi, so that's self-explanatory. But um, the IT challenges, the biggest ones we face is personnel costs tend to be the highest for all health centers, but I can guarantee you they're not high because we have a bunch of IT experts on staff. Most of the folks that we utilize are part of our care teams, they're clinical related. Um, and so not having that expertise in-house makes it difficult for us to deal with the, the myriad of changes that occur, as well as to make sure the system is as robust as it can be so that we're always ready to, to move forward. Um, the maintenance and support cost, if I've said that once, I've said it 30 times, and so that's why it's on this slide again. Uh, I will just end with just a couple of things about delivery system improvements using the, piece, uh, the uh, EHR. We are very fortunate in July of 2012 to have received a level three patient-centered medical home designation from the National uh, Committee on Quality Assurance. We're darn proud of that because we had to work very hard to do it. But at the, at the heart of it all, what it meant was, how are we better serving our patients? What are we doing that's making a difference? How are we a team? The, the medical community can create patients who are dependent, who believe they go in, you tell them what to do, and they go home. Therefore, if they don't get better, it's your fault. Um, and what we realize, it's a team concept, and the patient is at the center of that, meaning they have control over what happens. Some of the things that we're talking about, improvement um, for our chronic disease patients, our understanding, you gotta meet them where they are, uh, in uh, reasonable care plans that they have to have things that are accessible to them. I hear a lot about reach out to your patients and do text messaging and all different ways to get a hold of them. And our patients say, look, I have a limited amount of minutes and I'm not gonna let you use those up reminding me about patient visits. So when you recognize you've gotta know your audience, you gotta know who you're dealing with, you have to be willing to meet them where they are, not where you want them to be. And so these are some of the things that we're working on as far as delivery system. My time is, is my 600 seconds been up, so I'm gonna just uh, end with these three slides that show that 8% of the patients are typically in this Kaiser Triangle considered multiple chronic conditions. Almost 20% of our patients have more than one chronic disease. So when you hear us say health centers, our patients are sicker, this is what we're talking about. Uh, think about it, an uninsured patient who finally accesses care has probably delayed going to see about it. And so by the time they do get to us, we're dealing with more complex disease states and things that folks need to do. This is the comic relief that ends the presentation if it wasn't so serious. So when we adopted the PCMH, we thought it was simplistic. These seven steps, you do that, you'll be a better provider, you'll uh, provide better care. And this is what it actually looked like because every step generated 15 more steps and 15 more questions and things that we had to do. But being Jackie Bauer, we did it. And so uh, I, I'll just leave you with this. This is what uh, our staff says to themselves and in our management meetings every day, this is why we exist, that one who has health has hope and one who has hope has everything. And we believe that's why community health centers make such a difference in communities that we serve. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much, Benita. Actually, she who has the clicker has everything. <laughs>
we're going to make it uh, an instru instrument in the hands now of Brooks Miller, who is the head of the Jordan Valley Community Health Center in Northeast Missouri. Uh, in fact, the only CEO the center's had in its 11 years of existence. Mr. Miller has himself 30 years of healthcare experience. He's using all of it as his center expands to meet the needs of the uninsured. And Vernita mentioned that he does have a high volume of uh, business in his center. Um, so he is trying to meet the needs of the uninsured, of Medicaid beneficiaries, of other vulnerable groups in the Jordan Valley. And he's trying to help us learn a little bit more about that. Well, Brooks? <clears throat> thank you, Ed. I, I too uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here today and uh, appreciate the invitation from the Alliance to participate. As uh, Ed had mentioned, I have 30 years experience as an executive director at a community health center. And so when I was invited to attend this, they asked for me to summarize that within five minutes uh, and touch on the high points of my career. Uh, most of my staff would say that that's probably three minutes too long, but uh, uh, we'll see what we can do. It's a, another interesting fact, my uh, youngest son, uh, Joseph um, had the opportunity to do an internship out here with our National Association, and, and I commend the National Association. They represent us very well out here in Washington, D.C., and uh, really, uh, really do a great job. But at any rate, I had the opportunity to talk to Joe, and I said, son, I've been invited to uh, attend uh, the Alliance for Health and do a, do a presentation, sit on a panel. And he said, you know, that's, he said, I had the opportunity to go to some of that last year, and he said, that's the real deal. And he quickly followed that up by, why did they ask you? <laughs> so uh, I tell you what, this might be the intermission time for you today. And if you need to get up and step out, this could be it. And then uh, Michelle would, would follow up. But it is a real opportunity and, a, and always a pleasure for me to, uh, it, it's been a wonderful career. Uh, I moved to Springfield, Missouri, and there is a little correction with that. And that is in the southwest corner of the state of Missouri, the show me state. Um, when I first got to Springfield, we were a new start program. We, uh, I had the, uh, the ability to operate out of the back seat of my pickup truck and my checking account for the first three months, and it shows you how barren we were to, to begin with. Uh, there was a lot of opposition to our program when we first uh, established. We had turned in three previous grant applications, none of which were funded. The fourth one, however, was. Uh, when I got to Springfield, I felt like that our growth down there may be very limited. Uh, so I opened up our first health care clinic in a 4,500 square foot strip mall of which I intended for 3,000 to be medical and administration and 1,500 to be dental. Uh, five years ago, we moved into the uh, facility that's shown on your screen there. Uh, that uh, particular building is 70,000 square foot. Um, it provides a full array of services. Uh, we're very blessed. Um, as uh, Bernita had mentioned, to, to offer primary care, behavioral health, and uh, oral health services out of that building. We also have a very dynamic WIC program that is operated uh, through that center, uh, and it's the largest WIC program in the state of Missouri, and it is done in conjunction with the Greene County uh, and Springfield uh, Health Departments. And so we're really proud of that relationship and that affiliation. Um, this building was a blighted factory when we bought it. It only had about a third of a roof. It was a tractor distribution or tra tractor part distribution center. It was key to us because it sat centrally to the uh, population that we chose to serve in the Springfield area. And so uh, after the five years, uh, we uh, had the opportunity to, to expand it once again. And let me get the clicker here. Uh, there we go. Uh, this year, we're in the process, and on June 26th of this, uh, of this year, we will be expanding that piece of property, uh, or that clinic in particular. Uh, we'll be relocating our family practice, urgent care, pain management, behavioral health into the building. Uh, in addition, we'll be expanding somewhat our oral health program. Uh, Jordan Valley is unique in that we're somewhat divided evenly between oral health and primary care. Uh, as far as patients go, uh, and the reason uh, for a large part of our success and growth has, because, has been because of the emphasis that we placed on oral health uh, from the very beginning. Uh, once completed, we'll have a total of 120 medical exam rooms, 40 dental operatories. Uh, we'll have central sterilization located within that. Uh, we'll have an expanded pharmacy and expanded behavioral health. 
Uh, in addition, what's unique, I think, uh, to this particular, our particular program here is that we do have our own surgery center where we do a significant amount of oral surgery um, on a daily basis. Uh, we also have a pediatric residence, dental residency program that is operated in conjunction with Lutheran Medical Center uh, out of New York. Uh, we're in our second year of that program uh, with, uh, and we'll have eight residents uh, rotating through our program um, in, indefinitely. Uh, we also have a mobile program. We have uh, five mobile units. We have three of these particular trucks, which uh, are, are single exam rooms and optometry. Um, and in addition, we have two large vehicles where we operate our oral health programs from. Uh, we service 21 schools outside of Springfield. Springfield has a population of um, 250,000, I believe it is, but once you get out of our five out of the direct city and into our five county service area. It becomes very rural. Access to care is very limited. Uh, and so it's, uh, we've been able to develop this very robust uh, program and it's, it's worked out quite well for us. In addition to the schools that we serve, you can see there that uh, we also uh, work with the uh, county jails and nursing homes, uh, which uh, prevents a hardship for that. Let, let me go back. I will also say that we have three satellite clinics. Uh, one came online in 2009. Uh, Hollister and uh, Republic Clinics will come on this year and are part of the funding that we received uh, through new access points. Uh, each side of those will have four to, eight, four to eight medical exam rooms and four to eight dental rooms. Uh, for the past, uh, since moving into the new building, and that's the most accurate information I can provide with you going, out, going back to 2009, you can see there the number of users within our program as well as the number of patient encounters generated. Uh, as, and then what we anticipate through the Affordable Care Act uh, will transpire to additional users of our program as well as encounters. Uh, you can see we had a slight dip um, in 2013. Um, we have we ha in, in speaking to my staff, we have numerous excuses why that occurred. However, uh, in, in, in fairness, we have had a significant transition of medical providers during the past year, which I think truly did attribute to that, uh, as well as some service changes that we took, uh, took into consideration for the year. So we do anticipate with the opening of the new building yet this year that we will be back on a growth rate as uh, experienced in that chart. Uh, this is an extremely important slide and I draw your attention to this, and if I can figure this, uh, they said this, yeah, good. So now all you have to do is be able to hear me. And this is where Jordan Valley is a little bit different. Our total grant income only makes up 9% of our budget. Uh, and routinely across, uh, across our programs, that's a, a small amount of, of funding. And, uh, I'm very proud of that in one degree, uh, but you can see that we have generated revenue here that's the blue cycle, which is predominantly Medicaid, which will be shown on the next, the next slide. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that uh, really does concern me is um, <clears throat> that when we talk about funding of health centers, it can't only be about the grant. Uh, because there are, especially many of the new START programs that have just started up, you know, it is the reimbursement methodology that many of us live on and develop our programs around. And so we need to be consistent in our message that uh, how important uh, the, the revenue stream is for our programs. Let me go real quickly to the next slide and show you that Medicaid for us is 60 percent. If we ever uh, get into Medicaid expansion, this will go down, and we anticipate by going on to the exchanges, this 12% is gonna increase. And that's where our revenue, additional revenue should come from. My concern with that, and, and I caution you here about this, is to a degree, health centers are being pushed into a private sector model rather than a community health model uh, and I truly do believe that the focus or the treatment 
of disadvantaged patients is very different um, depending upon your social economic class. Um, and so, I, I, you know, that's just a caution I have. Now, if I go back to this, one thing I want to show you is that our revenue is, uh, on an annual basis, uh, just short of $29 million a year. Uh, so far, we were, we're privileged to be carrying a 1.2% margin, which if you did the math, is about $347,000. Um, while it's always good to be in the black, um, putting that into perspective, our two-week uh, payroll is about $430,000 a year. So you can see that we operate on a very thin line, and there are a lot of variables that impact us on a daily basis. Uh, while we have not passed Medicaid expansion in the state of Missouri, we have been the beneficiary of significant amount of resources that have come within our program or, uh, throughout the state. We've also had, in just the most recent uh, uh, application process, we have been awarded four new sites. Uh, so very positive things, expansion of services are taking place, and now that will bring us up to, I believe, 27 health centers throughout the state of Missouri. Bernita touched on this. I won't take much time with it. The medical home is um, something that uh, we are working with. Uh, I, I'm not certain of Bernita's perspective. Uh, my concern with the medical home, I think it's an excellent uh, philosophy uh, for patient care. Uh, my concern is the expense related to it. Uh, I think it is particularly important for children to be within this model and that they have access to all these different uh, support services. Um, but once again, it, it, just, it, it is very labor intensive and very expensive, and we have to be willing to make the investment if that's truly what we're interested in. Missouri uh, was the first uh, state that particip uh, began participation uh, with the medical home. Um, our State Primary Care Association, Joe Purley uh, serves as director of that, is very aggressive and progressive. Uh, we leveraged $1 million of our resources uh, to obtain $9 million through the Affordable Care Act uh, to implement this program. Uh, here is one little um, mistake that I did put in, at least one little one here. The IPA, which we just recently uh, implemented, it, which stands for the Indep Independent Practice Association rather than Integrated, um, even though integrated is wrong, I can say it's right, according to my son, because it's, it's not only independent, but it, it builds on the medical home model, which is integrated. Um, the, the, issue, uh, the, the wonderful thing about the IPA, it allows us to come together as health centers throughout the state of Missouri and contract uh, for services with HMOs, uh, health insurance programs, and things of that nature, which are, are tremendously beneficial. And right now we have 330,000 lives that are in that group of, um, w within that system, and that is a for-profit company that's been established. You can see the challenges real quickly, workforce development, which we've talked about today, re uh, reimbursement models, which we have concerns about, competition with the private sector, uh, patient responsibility. We've talked about that, and uh, we can't sell that too short. Uh, program accountability, if we're going to get the resources we do, we certainly need to be accountable for the increase that uh, is expected. And most importantly, it's the uncertainty. Um, as I said, Missouri has not expanded Medicaid at this time, and um, our session, uh, congressional session, concludes at 6 o'clock tonight, so we continue to make calls and to see if there's any changing of that and, and such. We don't anticipate it. But it's, you know, it, it's really unfortunate that we're coming down to the last day to determine whether we're going to have expanded Medicaid or not. Uh, why we do it all, just quite honestly, it's right there. And I have the benefit from my office to be able to walk down the hall and see why we put in the, the struggles that we do and, and, and such on a daily basis. And everybody's a part of it. I think that that's what's important. It's not only work we do on the ground. Uh, none of that work would be possible without the work that you all do here our associations and, and such, and we're very, very appreciative for that. Great. Thanks very much, Brooks. By the way, the, these last two folks have emphasized to me that they could probably have been part of the last two panels that we have put together at briefings and for one we have coming up. I mean, we did a session not long ago on the integration of behavioral health into primary care. Uh, just on Monday with our colleagues at, at Commonwealth, we talked about the states that are pursuing the third way of expanding coverage without uh, that dreaded Medicaid word. 
Uh, and we have a, a session coming up on May 30th, I think it is, uh, looking at PCMHs, which seem to be very central to the way you folks think about what you're doing. So uh, we must be doing something right, and you may get another invitation. <laughs> um, now we're going to turn to Michelle Prozer, uh, who's the Director of Research for the National Association for Community Health Centers. Uh, Michelle has a decade's worth of experience doing research and analysis about CHCs and the people they serve, and, uh, and in the process, offering up the results of that work to the communities directly affected so that they can improve their ability to serve. And the, uh, the idea that you can actually use research is a wonderful advancement, it seems to me, and I want to thank you for that, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm pleased to be here. So I was asked to respond to a lot of the things you heard, um, especially from Brooks and Vernita. Um, and I think what you'll hear from me that is what you heard already is very consistent with what we're seeing at the national level. Um, so hopefully I'll be reinforcing a lot of those things. Uh, what I hope to show, um, some of the things you've already heard, but I'd like to emphasize, that health center demand for health center care continues to increase, especially under the Affordable Care Act, but there's still a lot of unmet need out there that extends beyond um, insurance, new, people with newly, uh, new insurance cards who need a place to go. Um, I wanna echo how much the model actually works. It's designed to remove barriers and improve care outcomes and generate savings. And that health centers are a critical part of the healthcare safety net and will increasingly be so. Um, but as you've heard from the other panelists, um, there are some capacity challenges. Um, so I'll also be talking about the support that's necessary to maintain, but also expand that capacity. So starting with the challenges, um, as you've heard, there'll be some increasing demand and that's going to shift the payer mix. Um, we're gonna be seeing more Medicaid patients, more patients in private insurance plans, especially through the exchanges, um, but also still a large number of uninsured. And that actually does have an impact on revenue cycles too. So as you've heard from these folks and as I'll talk about, um, maintaining funding streams is a critical challenge. Health centers have diverse revenue streams um, and it's essential to maintain those streams for existing capacity, but also we need to think about how do we um, bring in um, or main, uh, increase those funding streams so that we um, are able to actually expand our capacity. Um, workforce is still in need, as you heard. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but also complex patients. Um, you've heard that health centers serve more patients with comorbidities. Um, but we're also serving patients that are really experiencing very entrenched social determinants of health, and those have um, very significant impact on their healthcare outcomes and their utilization of services and their cost. Things like um, uh, lower education or lack of healthy, uh, lack of access to healthy foods, lack of safe places to play and walk and move around, um, unemployment and so on. Um, so patients are very, very complex. Um, and um, health centers, though, are still very heavily invested in quality improvement activities as well as the infrastructure to help them do that. So we've talked a lot about HIT and hiring new staff um, and PCMH recognition, patient-centered medical homes. Um, as of last I've heard, um, from data from the Bureau of Primary Health Care, 44% of health centers already have been recognized officially as a PCMH, and the vast majority are undergoing um, other, um, are at various stages of, um, of reaching that recognition. Um, but again, examples of delivery system and infrastructure challenges still to be met. There is still a need for better integrated care, particularly access to specialty care for our patients. Um, and regardless of this, you know, uh, the insurance expansion that's taking place right now, there is a continued need for health centers. Um, there's a lot of unmet need out there. Um, there's rising demand, as we've talked about. There's still also a lot of communities out there without access to care, regardless of having an insurance card. In fact, 
um, as I'm going to show you in a second, insurance coverage is not enough to guarantee you access to care. And there will always be uninsured patients. I'll probably say that six or seven times in the next five minutes because it's still very critical. And these communities and these patients who need care need um, not just a comprehensive model of care, but need a very accessible uh, model of care that knows how to meet those specific needs, those complex needs we've talked about, and how to break down barriers to care. So this slide is actually, it's hard to see up here, I know, but it's actually in one of your handouts, or Access is the Answer uh, briefs that we've just released. Um, this actually shows at the county level what percent of residents are experiencing shortages of primary care physicians. 62 million people across the country do not have access to primary care because of shortages. It has nothing to do with whether or not they have an insurance card. In fact, most of them um, do have insurance. Only about 21% are uninsured. Um, but of course, the uninsured are at higher risk of falling in this category, um, given where they tend to live. 28% uh, of them are in rural areas, 43% are low income, and 38% are minority. Um, but of course, this is just one measure of unmet needs, that even when you live in a community that seems to have a lot of providers, those providers may not be there to serve all community residents, given um, their um, acceptance of certain insurances, the languages they speak, cultural barriers, um, lack of transportation, and so on. Um, and health centers actually have higher rates compared to other providers of accepting Medicaid patients, Medicare patients, uninsured patients, and even um, new patients. Michelle, before you change oh, sure. that slide, the 62 million mm -hmm. figure, what does that represent? So that represents a number of people who have uh, in who have, do not have access to primary care specifically because there's no primary care provider to serve them. So it's a population to provider count. Thank you for asking that. So I do want to just quickly touch base on the health center model. Um, I whoops, did I move the slide? No, I did not. I'm sorry. So um, I, I won't go through all of this, but the health center model is actually rooted in federal law and regulation. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that health centers are designed to break down very complex barriers to our patients' experience and provide comprehensive services, primary care, dental, behavioral health, vision, pharmacy, um, and other services that actually facilitate access to care, services that we call enabling services, like home visitation, case management, transportation, translation, and so on. Um, but health centers also work by being customized to fit each individual community's unique needs and circumstances. For example, they must be run by a governing model that is made up of a majority of patients, and that's very unique. Um, and we think this model of care not only explains why they're so successful in improving access to care, but also generates significant savings to the healthcare system, 24 billion annually. Um, and Leighton showed you a slide of their cost differences, and we've calculated it up to be at least 24 billion annually. And just briefly, um, health centers treat more uninsured patients, Medicaid and poor patients and other providers. It's probably obvious at this point. They also have um, um, more patients with chronic illness as well. I know we've talked a lot about Massachusetts. I know Leighton had a lot of great slides here. Massachusetts is a really great example of what to expect in this post-healthcare reform world. So I just want to emphasize two things. One is that um, you know there's still a large number of health center patients in Massachusetts that aren't insured. And that rate has been fairly steady over the last couple of years, too. It hasn't dropped um, below 2021%. Um, but the other thing is they serve, while, while the number of uninsured and the percent of state residents without insurance dropped, um, health centers are actually serving more of the state's uninsured. So wh whereas before health reform <coughs> occurred, they served 22% of all of the state's uninsured, suddenly, now with insurance expansion, um, they now serve 38% of the state's uninsured. Uh, and of course, um, I want to talk about growing and sustaining health centers. So as you've heard from Brooks, um, health centers tend to have very slim operating margins. And nationally, they hover around 0%. 
Um, I want to talk about federal health center funding because I think this is also another very critical piece. Um, well, the, this funding um, is very, very critical, as Leighton said, in helping to um, bring new community health centers and um, leverage other resources within communities, um, within existing communities, but also new communities. Um, health centers right now are, in, are facing a funding cliff. And that funding cliff is because of the trust fund that was in the Affordable Care Act will sunset soon. And if that happens, that, gener that will be a 70% cut in funding, which means health centers are facing a significant cut in their current capacity, meaning they would have to close sites, they would have to lay off staff, they would have to um, have fewer hours, and that, of course, is going to reduce the number of patients they can serve. Every community would um, experience this differently and have to apply the cuts differently. Um, so this might be a great question for Brooks and Bernita. How, would, how is it that they would handle such a cut? Um, and of course, this is also why, while demand is increasing for their care, and they're experiencing gaps in other revenue services, uh, revenue payment. Um, so again, the, this federal funding is really critical for supporting the cost of the uninsured, um, but also caring for um, or, or covering the full program that health centers provide. As, as Brooks called it, it's a, a community health model. And these grant dollars really help health centers expand that model to provide a lot of services that other providers aren't able to do. Um, and it also ensures that health centers serve all regardless of the, um, that patient's risk. They're able to take on a lot more patients with these federal resources. And it launches health centers into new communities as well. Um, health centers are also um, experiencing gaps in their Medicaid reimbursement. 81% of their costs are actually um, what they get paid in Medicaid. So in other words, they're losing about 20% of their costs that's not being reimbursed. Um, so these costs have not kept up with the cost of care. And um, we've heard about um, some, of the, what, some of the issues we're anticipating and are already experiencing with the exchange. Leighton talked about that. But I think the bottom line with these third-party payers is that as the number and percent of patients who have these forms of insurance increases, it doesn't make up for per patient losses. So we'll move on to my last slide. Um, so this is just a quick visual to show you the funding cliff that's anticipated, or would be anticipated. So moving on to future issues, obviously I think the need is to continue to build and maintain capacity and uh, meet those remaining needs. Um, the, and, and also to help health centers uh, continue to invest in quality improvement um, programs and infrastructure. The how, um, I know I've touched on quite a bit, but I, you know, I think these are really critical issues. Um, federal funding is still very important. It's not just about maintaining um, uh, or sustaining the current uh, capacity we have now, but we also need to think about how do we expand into new communities. Uh, workforce issues. Um, programs like the National Health Service Corps are, is also um, facing a funding cliff um, starting in the same time health centers would. And health centers are also, uh, many health centers are also participating in uh, the teaching health center program that's federally funded. And that funding also um, could expire unless it's renewed. And what that program does, unlike the National Health Service Corps, which places providers in underserved communities, the Teaching Health Center program is about training providers and then getting them to stay into the, in these underserved communities. Um, but on a positive note, um, health centers are able to put these investments into um, use very, very rapidly. Um, and I think the model is really designed to actually continue to improve care and improve outcomes and generate some significant cost savings. Um, so with that, I wanna thank you. I apologize for the brief presentation, but I look forward to questions and answers. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, we have now come to the point where if you would like to ask a question, there are microphones you can use. There are green question cards in your package that you can fill out and hold up, if you will, uh, and someone will bring them forward. And I wonder if, uh, uh, pending the lineup getting longer at the microphones, I might take just a moment to, to ask a clarifying question. Both. Michelle and Leighton had talked about the potential underpayment in private insurance. Now, mm -hmm. um, Medicaid is not known for its high rates, and most private insurance we keep hearing 
complains about Medicaid shifting costs to private insurance, uh, and you have a shortage of primary care providers in most parts of the country, how is it that community health centers don't have a little more negotiating clout with private insurance? One issue is that it's not entirely clear that health centers are, have been able to negotiate. You may recall that when the health insurance exchange plans began, they began rather hurriedly last year. What many health centers expected was that uh, insurers would come say, God, we desperately need you as a, as a partner, and we're willing to pay you a, a good rate. Medicaid pays enhanced rates, and the statute sort of suggested that that was the rate that they were supposed to be paid under the private health insurance exchanges, too. Uh, what's happened is that in many cases, uh, insurers said, you know, we already have a contract with you for private health insurance uh, in which we were paying you the same sort of rate that we would pay uh, a regular primary care doctor, and we are invoking that contract that we already had with you. So many health centers uh, actually were never contacted at all, never had the room to negotiate, uh, and then were locked into rates that they thought previously were only being used for regular private insured patients. So this is where things are still a little messy and a little unclear exactly what happened. Is this evolving somewhat this year as plans are about to set up their new rate filing agreements uh, and that we would expect a, a, a little bit more change over time. But that's why uh, in many cases they just, they just never had the negotiations. We've heard this from other essential community providers that they expected that at some point the insurers would come contact them. Uh, and, and in many cases, they never did, but then they said, we already have contracts if you live to those contracts that pre-existed. Who would have thunk it? Can I be quiet? Yes, go ahead, I, I just want to add, too, I, um, I, I agree with Leighton, and I think that it's really important that this plays out well for health centers. Um, uh, and part of that negotiation is that health centers historically, 14% uh, of their patients have had private insurance that is going to grow somewhat. We're not exactly sure how much. We were looking forward to watching and seeing what, how that happens. But in terms of negotiation, when you have several different private managed care contracts already for small percent, for a small number of patients, um, uh, suddenly that contract that you may be locked into is going to, and the payment you're receiving for those fewer patients is going to be that much harder to work with when say 10 patients moves to 50 patients to 100 patients. So it's, it's um, something that we're watching very, very carefully. Okay. Yes, sir. I'd ask the people who come to the microphones to identify themselves and their institutional affiliation if you have one and keep your question as brief as you can so we can get to as many questions as we can. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Um, Tony Hausner, formerly with CMS and now doing some work on the Affordable Care Act and, and an enrollment. I, I'm interested in hearing from some of the panel members what your recommendations, key recommendations would be to the federal government and uh, to state governments in terms of the Affordable Care Act. What are some of the key things that need to be done for this next go round in terms of enrollment and things like that? What are you, things within the current law that you think need to be addressed uh, at both levels? That's a little bit of a loaded question for Indiana because what we found was due to the significant division of interest of appealing, uh, excuse me, repealing or keeping the Affordable Care Act, we had a lot of folks who believed really erroneous information about what it was going to be. So we spent, I would imagine, the lion's share of our time explaining that there really weren't tracking devices going to be put in your arm if you got the Affordable Care Act. And whereas that sounds ridiculous, some of the information that was being shared was so over the top that people were afraid of it. The folks who needed it were afraid of it. Um, and so for us, it, it's been an awareness building. I believe now that Indiana is expanding access to low-income families. Perhaps there'll be more awareness and education for 
potential consumers so that they can learn the actual facts. Uh, the other thing is what we realize is if you've never had insurance, it's a, a difficult thing to understand with premiums and um, the difference between a deductible and didn't I pay for that this month and why am I paying an additional thing like that? So there were, there were those kind of components that just had to do with insurance that folks really didn't get it. They had never uh, been a part of it. Yes, sir. Uh, Michael Costa with Apt Associates. First of all, thank you all for a terrific and very informative uh, presentation. Uh, this question is for the uh, entire panel, whoever wants to pick it up. What has the experience been out there so far, or what you anticipate it's going to be, preferably any information on what's occurred so far, as regards individuals who were previously traditional Ryan White clients, HIV AIDS positive individuals, who are now moving into Medicaid or other insurance-based care, and I think likely finding their way to other care settings, uh, such as FQHCs or CHCs generally. Well, uh, you know, first of all, in many cases, uh, FQHCs actually also operate Ryan White uh, AIDS care, and so, so they're already serving those patients in, in many, many sites. Uh, obviously, for, for not only HIV patients, but for many other patients who uh, have some serious chronic illnesses, some of them will be coming into insurance coverage for the first time. And then, then hopefully getting coverage at a health center is a blessing to the extent that it provides them a broad access uh, of care. In many cases, they will still have uh, the ability to access care at more specialized sites uh, like Ryan White sites or other places that exist. Uh, if they so have it. It might be confusing to people, though. I mean, if, the, if you've been used to getting care at one facility and that ins facility now no, is not part of that, say, private insurance network with the exchange, then it will take some, some orientation of how can they figure out how to get those care services. My understanding of the way Ryan White works is, is that even if someone is privately insured, they would still be able to get certain services from the Ryan White centers. So they still have that access, but it could be confusing to some of the patients. Rick, do you have, did you want to comment on that as well? The, the only thing I would comment, and unfortunately, this is where I believe Missouri is well behind probably a lot of places in the nation, and we're just really getting active in the exchanges and such. Uh, as far as Ryan White and HIV uh, patients, uh, we see more, we, we have a very strong um, program in the Ozarks um, that uh, is run by uh, Lynn Meyerford, who serves as the executive director to that and also sits on my board of directors. Uh, and, and they have the medical side of it fairly well down. Uh, where we assist mostly uh, with Ryan White is with regards to oral health care services, which are very limited in a lot of places. Now that's kind of a, uh, a two-edged sword. In 2005, Missouri discontinued services to adult population as far as oral health coverage in Medicaid. So there is no Medicaid related to that, and many of those patients participate in our sliding fee program. On a positive note, Missouri this year passed a reinstatement somewhat of those uh, benefits of oral health uh, back to the adult population, as, and so far has put $45 million, I think, towards that effort. Uh, and should that hold, should the governor go ahead and release those funds, I think it'll have a very positive impact, not only uh, for the HIV Ryan White population, but uh, for those with uh, mental disorders and things that have also been separated or, or, or taken out of that system. Hi, Hi uh, Florence V with No Health Without Mental Health. Uh, first of all, thank you all for the panel for a um, very informative and insightful um, uh, discussion. I'd like to get this issue on the table of um, integrated uh, behavioral health care into primary care uh, and get your views on the, this, uh, uh, this issue that no one talks about but is the, is the real uh, deal killer, which is we live in a world of segregated behavioral health system delivery and provider payment. And um, this segregation effectively prevents uh, real integration. Um, what, what we really, I know we, we've sort of moved from a cross-referral model of integrated care, 
uh, where primary care physicians refer patients to a behavioral, but the reality is most patients will not go to a behavioral health referral. So then we move to a bi-directional integrated care model, which drops a behavioral health professional into uh, the primary care setting. But still, the big issue on the table that we never seem to be able to address is that under a managed behavioral health carve-out system, uh, behavioral health providers cannot work and get paid in primary care. So my question is, haven't we come to a time when we need to have behavioral health as just another standard medical benefit under health plans? So in other words, uh, and segregated delivery and payment. Uh, I leave that open to the panel. Thank you. Yes, Rick is a great example. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the answer to your question is yes. Um, you know, quite honestly, uh, for, for me, behavioral health has been one of the very difficult things for me to gain an understanding of. I think in comparison to oral health or primary care, which I believe has an end, behavioral health care oftentimes does not. My frustration, exactly as you said, as you try to integrate that into the primary care setting, which I truly do believe that's where it should be, uh, it is, uh, you don't get paid for it. Uh, you, you, you know, if you have a patient that comes in, sees your primary care provider who recommends that they have a counseling time with a behavioral health specialist, uh, you get paid for one of those services and not two. Uh, so you send the patient back home, you hope they come back, and it really defeats the purpose of an integrated care system. And, and I think that that's an issue that truly has to be addressed. Uh, I do believe also that behavioral health is um, the, the challenge of the future. I, I think as, as we look at workforce development and things like that, that there's a real shortage of such. Uh, we know also that uh, depression, antidepressants and things are probably the most prevalently prescribed drugs by primary care providers who need the assistance of behavioral health really to, to navigate uh, those interactions. And so uh, I, I don't know how we move forward from nationally, how we move that forward in a better way. It, it also has to be addressed at a local level, on a state level, uh, to try to get Medicaid to recognize the importance of an integrated system. And it's un unfortunate as we push for a medical home where you have all these services available and not reimburse for it, you're, you're just defeating it. You, you know, the, and, and if you go to the exchanges and they're going for the lowest possible price, issues like integration are certainly something that are pushed to the side and, and not incorporated within those plans. Anita? Anita? Thanks. Thank you. Can I add just a, a quick moment of clarification for something Brooks mentioned that some of you might not get? It, it, it depends, varies from state to state, but many states, uh, any services that a patient gets at an FQHC are paid once. Uh, so even if you get medical services and behavioral care services, you may only get one payment that's sort of an integrated payment. To some extent, you think about integration of care could be a good thing. On the other hand, what they say is it discourages them from providing behavioral care as that second service. So they'd rather have financially someone come back another day for the, the mental health services, which is sort of an inefficient way to do things. States have the option to have separate billing for behavioral care and physical care, uh, but, but, but the majority of states don't implement that system. And I would just add, without getting into the weeds, Indiana, um, our primary care association several years ago was really concerned about this issue and really lobbied our legislature so that they do honor two-day uh, same-day visits for behavioral health for a limited number of what they call brief interventional therapy associated with a medical diagnosis. And what we find is for families that are dealing with children with ADHD or anxiety or depression, things that the primary care provider can help manage until they can get to a more comprehensive mental health provider, that our state actually listened to that. And so instead of us saying, we're gonna have to send you home because we don't make any money today, uh, we went through our state legislature and we were able to get compensated for that. So I think it's a matter of what you do in your state and bringing that to their attention of how, remember I said, you've got to meet patients where they are. Um, and it's not meeting them where they are if we're sending them home because we don't get paid. And is that system in place? Other states, and uh, Leighton, you were talking about the great variation. Is that something that is uh, on the way in a bunch of places, or is, it, is uh, Indiana blazing a path? 
I must admit, at one point I knew, but I've forgotten how many states have same-day billing. Is there anyone here who, who remembers? I know Emily Jones was here just a moment ago. She would know, but I think Emily's left. And I, I sorry? Half? Half. Yeah, okay. it's increasing. And then also, I think under um, the Health Home Provision of the Affordable Care Act 2703, there's, we're also seeing kind of new and other creative ways of trying to more rigorously and comprehensively integrate within primary care or also on the community mental health side. Um, you know, sometimes some states have state plan amendments for their community mental health programs to kind of flesh out uh, their, you know, their primary care, particularly for kind of the persistent and severely mentally ill. So it's really on both on both sides. So I'm not saying it's not an issue. It's an issue, but I do think that there are are um, there's a lot of innovation going on across the country. Excuse me. Yes, Bob. Bob Griss with the Institute of Social Medicine and Community Health. It sounds like there are lots of reasons to look at community health centers as a laboratory for experimentation in how to address the, the unique needs of patients with low income, with minority status, with, with uh, a disproportionate amount of social determinants of poor health. And, I'm wonder and yet there's a lot of variation among the centers, as we saw based on the, on the payer mix that their clientele represent. My question is really a, a research question, uh, and that is, have you, Michelle, focused enough on differences among the centers, among the community health centers, so that you can make recommendations for healthcare policy at the state and federal level, so that the lessons that you've learned in how to deliver effective care to the population that is primarily the uh, recipients of services in community health centers can be translated into standards of care for Medicaid, for, for um, quality standards in insurance in general. So concretely, for example, if you're not being reimbursed through the grant from, from uh, um, the 330 grant for a lot of the subsidies needed to fill in the gaps between the medical care and other social services needed in the community. Maybe there ought to be models, uh, programs at the state level that have that function for the people who are not lucky enough to be in the, in the safety net that uh, the community health centers represent. Michelle? Um, I think it's a very interesting question, and I think we're just scratching the surface, honestly, especially when um, it comes to um, measuring those social determinants of health. Um, we know they're there, and we're starting to actually collect more information on them. Um, I think there's a lot of evidence out there in terms of health center um, programs um, and looking at specific um, underservice across our patients in terms of insurance and low income and some education um, and how those um, interventions have led to improved care. Um, but I would love to see you know, more research about how do we actually um, include more of those social determinants of health, um, define those in, and test those innovations um, that worked in one health center and moved it to another health center um, and how do we um, customize those interventions to work across different communities that have you know, maybe a different language, different cultural need, um, or just, just a different social determinant. Um, I think as health centers are asked to participate more in um, ACOs and integrated care models, that's also really critical. I think um, you're, um, one of the things that health centers really brings to those things is not just a foundation in primary care, but an understanding and a plan for meeting social need and how that social need could really impact um, health outcomes and cost. 
Um, and um, I think some people, and I know Melinda has more to add on this, but I think um, you will you would also hear people say that these are factors that um, need to be considered in risk adjustment modeling as well. Risk adjustment is mostly based on medical acuity, um, um, uh, gender and age, and um, not enough on social factors, and um, more and more organizations are paying attention to this. So I'd like to see more work on risk adjustment modeling that includes um, uh, just how at risk health center patients and safety net patients are. I think um, your, base, your, your starting statement about kind of health centers as a laboratory from which the rest can learn, mm -hmm. I think is actually, we have a good example of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the Commonwealth Fund supported for five years a demonstration with 65 community health centers in five different states to kind of figure out what does it take to become a patient-centered medical home. This was a demo that was led by uh, Jonathan Sugarman and, and Ed Wagner, both of whom are in Seattle, Washington. And not only did they create kind of a, a, a change package and a set of modules and implementation, you know, guides for what does it take and what are and but kind of came up with a sequence that is now actually being used by um, academic health centers uh, through residency training programs at Harvard or you know private practices. And so I think there are examples where community health centers have actually uh, been pioneers and led and that we are beginning to see some of that spread uh, in, in private practices and in, in a bunch of integrated delivery systems. So we should probably move on to our next speaker or question. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Seth Kruger. I'm, a, I'm an emergency physician and health policy fellow at GW. Um, we've heard a lot about the, the different issues and uh, challenges you've raised as far as FQ, FQHC space in terms of uh, reimbursement and workforce and you want to get just a little bit oh, closer to the microphone. Sorry about that. No, uh, thank you. So you, you've discussed at length a lot of the, the reimbursement workforce challenges that FQHCs have, um, and a lot of critics of the ACA's coverage expansion have suggested that um, you know with the problems in the primary care safety net we have, that increasing coverage is simply going to dump a lot more patients on already crowded emergency departments. Uh, can you address those concerns? Um, who wants to go for workforce? Or? So let me just make sure I understand the yeah. question. So the question isn't so much of a workforce question, or maybe it is. It's really about are we going to um, further bloat our emergency departments, which will only um, increase costs, since that's a more expensive primary. That's a more expensive place to obtain primary care than in in an FQHC. Uh, Brooks, go ahead. I I, I don't have a, an answer, I, I, but. To, to, to kind of go a little bit further, I think, um, from my experience when I went to Springfield. Uh, for instance, uh, there was access to primary care. There's access to primary care in any community that has a hospital. And unfortunately, that's the areas that you work, the ER, and we know while it's, it's the most expensive level of care that you can get, uh, you know, that's where a lot of people go. What, what they didn't have access to was oral health, uh, and, and so we were able to build, I mean, we, we built on oral health and then came back and backfilled on primary care. Uh, one of the biggest frustrations I have is, uh, and we talk about access, and I think there was a graph that was brought up there that we can get patients in in one or two days. Uh, and, and I think it goes back to somewhat the theme that we've talked about here today. Uh, and one of the things I, I feel like the Affordable Care Act may have missed somewhat, and, and there, there may be disagreement on that. but. It's not built around the patient and, and what the patient does. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, I tell my people all the time, if, if we don't get a patient in today, more than likely, that patient is gonna do what? Excuse me? Go to the ER. And, and you know, we live in a time when uh, we, we have expectations, we want immediate service. <clears throat> if, you, if a lot of the population who has private insurance was given the option of waiting two days to go see your primary care provider, many of us probably would. But we're dealing with the third or fourth generation of population who has sought and gotten their primary care out of the emergency room, and there's really no opportunity to shift that, that back to the, to, to the primary care site or the medical home where it should be. Now that's the emphasis of the medical home, one of the things we should work with, but you have to have buy-in from the patient. And oftentimes what we're seeing is, and, and we had a discussion last evening about this, is we are not seeing that buy-in from the patient and breaking that, that routine is a very difficult challenge. Just a, if a I could add, oh sorry. 
Just okay, everybody has something they want to say, <laughs> so let's keep it snappy. Go ahead. Uh, I, mean, I think one of the things that was a common misconception under the ACA was that as we expand insurance, emergency room costs will fall. I think now, with more experience, we understand that when people have insurance cards, they are actually more likely to, to use ERs. In fact, the primary users of ERs are privately insured. They use them at far more rates than the uninsured. Um, now, however, that being said, FQHCs are, are clearly something that help get people out of the emergency room to the extent that they get the primary care. This is why the expansions of FQHCs is so important as a systemic effort to try to sort of meet those needs before things turn into emergencies. And, yeah, and just to oh, emphasize, it, it's, oh. it's, you, you need to expand insurance and sources of primary care at the same time. Leighton said it very well. I would just look backwards to look forward. The ACA also provided for the significant expansion of community health centers, but due to sequestration and other financial hits that the, the federal government took, some of that funding was diverted for appropriations to keep the annual grant. So the growth of health centers, while a lot, is not at the same pace, I believe, as it would have been. But I agree, our emergency room physicians feel just like you do. Um, and I imagine that's the case everywhere. And so I think we're all saying the same thing is expand community health centers and expand access. All right, I'm not going to say anything else because it's all, I think enough has been said on that. Okay. And, and I, I took somebody out of turn, and I believe this gentleman was next in line. Look, I'm uh, Chauncey Killen. I'm just a regular citizen, no degrees or nothing. Uh, and just like the panel that... Uh, has a desire to meet the needs for the uninsured, I do too. I just have some concerns about the Affordable Care Act and the cost factor and how it's gonna help when we dismantle 75 or 80% of healthcare that's already working for a, a small percentage of people. Yes, they're important, but you would think that intelligent people as yourself and those that run this country would be able to create a system without dismantling something that's 80% effective, not perfect, but effective to put together something that we're not even sure, not without even yeah. trying pilot programs in various cities to see if it'll work and then, instead of taking 20% or whatever the percentage is of our government costs to try to hope something will work to help 20% uh, of a nation. Thank Anybody you. want to take a crack at that first? Ed, you want to go? Well, sure, but I, I, I don't want to preempt our expert witnesses here. Uh, well, I will take a crack at it. Uh, it's not clear that we're destroying 80% here. Uh, and in fact, I think what we've heard today uh, in large part, is uh, evidence that there has been a lot of uh, learning from uh, the 20 percent, if you will, of your uh, concern uh, about the ways in which we ought to be able to reaching out uh, to reach out to uh, plug some of the gaps in the system. I mean, even after the ACA is fully implemented, and if it goes according to plan, which some people might think is a uh, uh, long shot, we're still going to have 30 or 35 million people who don't have health insurance who are going to need some place to get care. And at least at this point, uh, there's been a lot of agreement between Democrats and Republicans going back for the last generation or so, so that FQHCs, that these community health centers are a good way to try to meet some of that need, not all of it. So um, that's one of the reasons we thought it would be useful to shine a light on some of the things that are going on in the CHC world uh, and to try to grapple with some of the challenges in trying to implement this law in a way that doesn't destroy what's already working. Anybody else have a response? I guess I, yeah, okay. Hi, my name is Brian Balicki with TFI. Um, I have a two-part question. One is um, research-related, and the other is more clinical slash operations. It was nice to see. Excuse me. Could I, I, I hate to interrupt the question. I, I don't want to preclude it, 
keep your uh, keep your two parts. Uh, but could I just ask folks, this will probably be our last question, given the time we have left, despite Melinda's 27 green cards and your nice filling them out. Uh, and so I, what, what I would like you to do instead is to use these last few minutes while you're listening to the two-part question to fill out the blue evaluation forms uh, that are in your kits. Yes, sir, I'm sorry to have interrupted. Sure, thank you. Uh, my, the first part of my question is it was nice to see the differences between uh, what you call CHC users and non-users. Those have been replicated over decades. Uh, the question I have on, on that financial figure is, have you done any research to show what those differences look like when you look at some of the more complex cases that CHCs use versus other, or CHCs treat? versus other providers, diabetes, hypertension, uh, episodes of newborns and deliveries, do those same kinds of differences hold up when you begin to look at subgroups of sort of the, the bread and butter, I would think, of CHCs? And then the other part of my question is, whatever those differences are, what, what are some of the unique things or what, I, what might be distinguishing what CHCs do versus all the other providers in the systems that CHCs might be able to sort of tout themselves on and say, hey, we're here to take on the, be you know, the toughest cases, the biggest challenges. Sure, so uh, you're mentioning that we, we did a, a study that sort of compared medical expenditures for CHC users versus non-users. That analysis actually tried to statistically control for a wide variety of differences, so it tried to say, Yes, we understand that someone who's diabetic or someone who has heart disease may be more expensive than someone who's in, in good health. So we try to statistically control for, you know, looking at that among the CHC users and the non-users. So that was an average, even after adjusting for insurance status, after adjusting for health status. So, you know, to the extent possible, we tried to make it, you know, sort of simple. So here's the overall average impact. Uh, I, I can't say that we did it, you know, on a, on a disease by disease basis. But nonetheless, we were trying to control for health status to the extent that we could. Mm -hmm. Now, why do they do this? Uh, I'll, I'll say that you know, these sorts of exercises don't necessarily fill in all the questions about why those differences exist. We tend to think, again, it's that there's a lot of evidence that health centers provide good primary care services. And that part of this, once again, is, is that you know, many of the patients uh, who, who are comparable to health centers Patients are, are uninsured and low-income patients who, frankly, have difficulty getting access to primary care services. So part of the reason may be that they're you know, just not able to get to a primary care service, whether it's a regular private primary care physician or whoever. So eventually they end up in the ER. Eventually they end up admitted as a diabetic who hasn't controlled their diabetes status. <clears throat> and so that's part of it. Though I, I will say we found the expenditure reductions both in ambulatory care, emergency care, and inpatient care. So it suggests that once again, primary care for this needy set of patients really made a big difference in terms of, of improving health status and reducing medical expenses. Bernita and then Michelle, can we get some quick comments from you? Yeah, I would just add operationally, you've heard the term uh, necessity is the mother of invention. With our uninsured patients have very limited access to specialty care or other providers, meant the health center had to do as much as possible to help these patients manage chronic disease. So that's not to say we tried to become a nephrologist when we were not, but all the things that we needed to do to wrap around the patient so that we were addressing and meeting as much of the need as we could, which included addressing the social determinants of health. And, you know, if it's a diabetic, that's great. Can you get your medicine? That's the question every doctor will ask. But are you eating? And if you're not, how do we get you access to healthy food <clears throat> or regular food? Those kind of wraparound services, I think, differentiate community health centers because we're looking at the whole patient and what are all the needs and things that are coming against them in their life. Those aren't the things that get reimbursed, but that is the mission of every community health center. And, and I would simply add, in, in my opinion, and you go back to that slide I had on the FQHC model, um, that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, that it really takes all those pieces in terms of being tailored to the community's specific needs, 
um, to having the diverse services and those enabling services regardless of whether or not they get paid and they often don't get reimbursed by third party. Um, defining health broadly, doing regular community needs assessments, um, having an active quality improvement program and a quality improvement plan, um, and being required to serve all in the community in need um, and to target those patients specifically. Um, I, I think that's really what does it. It's that model together, but also makes health centers um, a good model for I want to go there. I mean, for a good model for anyone who is looking for um, a very broad, high-quality program of care. Sounds like a pretty good way to bring this discussion to a close. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you to the rest of the panelists. And uh, let me just take this opportunity to say thank you also to our colleagues at the Commonwealth Fund um, for providing expert uh, participation and co-sponsorship for this briefing. Uh, to you for uh, bearing with us, even though we couldn't get to the questions that you wrote on the green cards, but you did ask some good ones at the microphone. Uh, and please join me in thanking our panel for a very enlightening discussion.